how she traveled, and her women who made a difference. A cool kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview with Rachel Gunderson, conducted on April 28, 2006, by Parker. Part 1. We all three knew Carol Gunderson. Um, uh, my last name was Gunderson, too, and I, I was related to her through marriage. Yeah. My husband was a nephew of hers, and so she was an aunt. She, she married a Gunderson as I married a Gunderson. Yep. So. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So did you guys all know each other? We oh, all yeah, know, oh, yeah. each, we know yeah. each other really well, and that'll come out through the interview, I think. But they knew Aunt Carol. I call her Aunt Carol. Okay. They knew her a long time ago. Uh, um, we, we all uh, worked with her in League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but we sometimes I knew her in other ways, too. Just she was a friend of my mother's and was in an organization with my mother. And uh, they were among the women joining three teachers in La Crosse who, right after women got the vote, would stand on the post office street corners and hand out flyers and that would encourage women to vote now that they were allowed to vote legally and uh, they they had to work very hard because at that time women didn't think that they could have opinions of their own they had to ask their husbands what they should think and and that and the League of Women Voters organization which came out of this effort was to encourage women that they had minds too and that they should use them, and they should study, and they should learn, and then they should make their own make, make up their own minds, no matter what their husbands had to say about it. So uh, that was uh, one of Carol's earliest beginnings as a leader in this uh, fine organization, League of Women Voters. I was uh, living in Beloit, Wisconsin and came to La Crosse in 1951, which is a long time ago to you people. And um, when I said that I was going to La Crosse, my League of Women Voters friends said, oh, you're going to that, where that wonderful woman teaches, or, or is living. Uh, <clears throat> at that time, Carol Gunderson was um, the state president of League of Women Voters. And uh, so I knew I was going to be joining good company when I came to La Crosse in uh, 1951. So you guys all knew uh, Ms. Gunderson through the League of Women Voters? And, 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 and then I knew her at family things because I don't know if you're aware, but the Gunderson family is a huge family. And there's still a lot of Gundersons around La Crosse. Uh, the man who started the Gunderson Clinic was, was Adolf Gunderson, and he had seven sons and one daughter. Six of the sons became doctors, and four of them settled in La Crosse. So that Aunt Carol was the wife of one of those four that settled in La Crosse. And they all lived close together in La Crosse, down on 15th, 16th, and Cass and King yes. Street areas. And so they got together where in Grandmother Gunderson's house every Sunday night for dinner. And she had a huge house. And she had lots of help with cooking, although she was a good cook herself. Uh, so they all got together there. That's how I first knew Aunt Carol when I started dating my husband 50, oh, 60, no, 58, eight years ago. Okay. I went to Logan, he went to Central. And we met at the railroad tracks or in the marsh. <laughs> Not quite, but but anyway. And so then I'd go to some family parties. And this was a thing, a side of Aunt Carol that I admired too, because she was good at everything. She was a real superwoman. She was president of lots of organizations, even at the national level. We'll tell you more about that, or you can read about it. But also, she was an excellent cook. 
she gave superb parties, you know, with lace tablecloths and linen napkins. Um, she, she did all kinds of homemaking things, like making jam and canning things. Uh, I understand I never saw her work, but I understand stood for my sister-in-law. She was really good. Women at that point were taught embroidery and, and uh, handwork. Uh, of course, she was really good at that sort of thing. So she just threw fabulous parties. Yes. And, and so that, that was a fun too. part, too. Oh, I was a nervous wreck the first times I went. I mean, I was 18 years old. Did and you I, have to get, like, dressed up? Oh, did you have to get dressed up? Mm -hmm. I didn't have much money. My dad was a Lutheran minister on the north side, and I didn't have much money. But I would save my money to buy a dress so I didn't feel embarrassed going to the, this fancy household with all these Gundersons. It was amazing. It turns out they're pretty nice, down-to-earth people. But for me, being this little girl from the north side, I didn't feel real yeah. comfortable, usually. <laughs> um, what sticks out in your mind most about her? Like the trait that you guys... Well, I think her leadership skills were outstanding. Uh, she was able to uh, conduct the meeting at uh, the State League, for instance. I think one of the first years that I was uh, in La Crosse, she invited me to go with the, the group to uh, a State League meeting. And uh, she always found something for an individual to do so that you felt that you were there as a worthwhile member rather than uh, just going along. And I, I think that was very outstanding in her characteristics. She spoke very well. She was very articulate, but she also uh, insisted that people study hard that they know what they were talking about, that they would not just get up and, and uh, recite uh, slogans and whatnot. She was, uh, and in our league, we studied in small groups, and uh, she had us studying and reading, and I think that's why when she got up to speak, and she was a good speaker, she was so convincing because she knew what she was talking about. And, and Rachel talked more about when she was in Washington, but uh, she uh, she moved around enough so that she ended up knowing more about the rest of the country, not just about La Crosse. But I think that, that her insistence on studying and learning what your subject was, no matter what it was, uh, is uh, an absolutely starting point to be a leader. And, and therefore, lots of men in La Crosse were kind of afraid of her, actually, <laughs> and, and, but respected her. In fact, something that got her publicity all across the United States was in, oh, what year was it, 1951? There's all kinds of stuff on this that, that, that I brought for you to, to um, print out. But she was elected Man of the Year in La Crosse. Now that was the first time that ever happened. It had always been a man who was elected Man of the Year. But this was an award given by the Chamber of Commerce and all kinds of members of the Chamber voted on it and other organizations. But they voted her in because she had made so many contributions to La Crosse. She worked hard to have better education. She worked for uh, the Girl Scouts, the Y, um, the Red Cross during the war. She ran the Bloodmobile around here. Uh, the, the community was well, called the United Way, now the Community Foundation. So in some of the things that I brought, you'll see she was featured in, in the St. Paul Pioneer Press, in, in the Milwaukee, big Milwaukee newspapers, uh, because of this award and other things she'd done uh, in the community. One of the huge things was, and I have, there's a picture of us that I brought too, um, because I was a local president of the league, 
and therefore went as a delegate to a national convention in 1970 in Washington, D.C. It was at that point that Aunt Carol was, a, she had been a vice president of the National League, but she was running the first ever campaign for the League of Women Voters nationally to raise $11 million. That'd be like, what, $500 million now. Um, to raise money from organizations and, and businesses like Highland and Brewing Company at that point in La Crosse. Big bucks to start a foundation to educate citizens about voting. And so she went around the country and went into boardrooms with all these CEOs, these, these heads of corporations, to ask them for funding for the league. Um, I remember at that convention I was so proud of her. I was just proud to be there with her. I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Anyway, there's a picture from that time. Because also at this national convention, you regularly went to see your, your lawmakers. And one of them at that point from this area was Vernon Thompson. He was really from Richland Center, wasn't he, I think? Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's a picture of us with Vernon Thompson. And, um, and, I'm in, and, and it's Aunt Carol and me and, and the other league delegate, Lois Riley, and then Aunt Carol's daughter, Cigna, who's a friend of mine. And it's just embarrassing. The skirts are so short and my legs are so fat. And I must have been terribly embarrassed. But there we are in the Capitol with Vernon Thompson, you know, feeling, wow, isn't this pretty special? So there are all kinds of good memories connected with her. And, and, and in her powerful role, and as Peg and Marion say, she was so good at presenting things, uh, articulate. One other thing that I'll mention now, has anybody ever heard of Wellesley College? No. There's a very famous woman in the United States who's still famous today. She's a senator from New York. Uh, she was the president's wife who went to Wellesley College and was graduation speaker, I think president of her class. Hillary Rodham Clinton went to Wellesley College, which was an all-girls college, all women's college, uh, in a suburb of Boston. And Aunt Carol went there and graduated. She was head of the student government. She graduated with high honors. And um, she ended up being a trustee of that college down the line. So she was involved with national things besides just local things. Wait, wasn't she called to, to uh, represent uh United Nations. Yeah, on the um, uh, for the United um, the UN after World War II. Seems to me that she was. I I brought something for you to scan too about that. Uh, when the United Nations started, the League had observers there, and I think it was League Success New York. Uh, and Aunt Carol was one of the League ex observers at the point that the delegates were putting together the United Nations. Uh, she was on a White House committee. Yeah, and she was appointed to stuff all over creation. And those of us in La Crosse, like me, I may be, what, 10 years, 8 years younger than you two. Uh, yeah. Women didn't do much outside of the home. You were meant to, following World War II, have your kids, I have five sons, have your kids take care of your husband and uh, make sure that wear you set hat. a beautiful, wear your wear hat and gloves, gloves and when you went put out. on a good dinner, you know, for people. So, so Aunt Carol, the thing that she did for a lot of us at that time was she was a role model for us that says, hey, it's okay to get involved in your community. It's okay to have your own opinions. Um, it's okay to speak out. It's okay to fight for things like good education in La Crosse, which the three of us certainly did. And then she ended up being on the Board of Education. Um, but, but to have women get involved in government. She, th that's what she meant to so many of us. She could do everything. Th that's what was tough to try to follow her because she could still do everything well at home, plus do all this other stuff. 
So she was my main role model when yeah. I was growing up. What do you think inspired her to do all of this? To you want to help the community? Well, she was a very bright woman, and but uh, going off to college, continuing education was not so common. Mm -hmm. there, but across the country, there were more and more women going to college, and uh, as Rachel said, many of them were just expected to uh, to get married and have children, and that would be the end of their intellectual life. They're, they're studying things, reading things, and discussing things. And actually, the origin of the organization, the Association of University Women, began because these were, were women in in a community who had been to college, and maybe they were back taking care of a husband and children, but they were anxious to talk to other women who had been to college and had, had learned all kinds of different things. And they wanted to keep talking about, to, uh, to each other about these things, so they formed little groups within this organization, and she was president of this at one time, I think, and uh, she belonged to a, a very old group from the 1930s called Book Fellows, and she, um, they met twice a month for about 10 months a year, and, uh, and they, they each took turns studying a, a writer and they would read as much of the writer's work as, and they would be like writing a term paper. It would be very, uh, but they would work hard out of it. And uh, uh, it was a way of, of um, keeping that mind going <laughs> when they yeah. had, uh, uh, you know, and it didn't mean that that there weren't women out there who hadn't been to college who weren't very lively minded and were reading and studying. But the going off to school, continuing your education, no matter how you did it, was very important and, and got, they, they were excited about what they learned. They, they liked school, you know? They weren't fight, they were, and they were lucky to go. They were the fortunate people that could go because they had enough money to go. Well, and I think one other thing, um, I, I've had very mixed feelings about segregated schools, all girls schools and all boys schools, uh, but an advantage for women at that point was that, that they were stimulated by other women who were interested in, in education too, and they weren't knocked down by guys, because guys, the higher you go in education, it used to be, they were the shining stars, and, and girls weren't so. That's changed now. In fact, there are more successful women in college now than men, uh, but that wasn't true way back then. So if a girl wanted a really good education and talk to other people who would listen to her and admire her, have leadership possibilities, and all girls college was not a bad idea. Yeah. You, they were very expensive you had to be able to afford it. I don't know what her father did. Was he a lawyer? Uh, he must have had a fair amount of money yeah. to be able to send his daughter to a place like that. But I think that that's part of what um, helped encourage her to develop the way she developed. That's just speculation, but I would guess that that helped. May I interrupt here and see if there's anything else? Well, I don't know what other questions you have to ask. A little louder, please. I don't know what other questions the students have to ask. What do you What do you think, Maggie um, Mitch Parker? Yeah, I think that would be good. Okay, so find out if Peg has anything. Any last say? comments that you'd like About to say? Carol? Do you have any specific questions yeah. you'd like to ask either of them? Um, Parker, do you? I don't. Just anything that you think would be important <coughs> about her. Do you remember a life? specific story about her? You know, a time that you 
sense of humor. <laughs> Don't yeah, you have a sense, had of, a humor? sense of humor? Yeah, she a sense of humor. We enjoyed hearing her tell stories from Washington, D.C., because we weren't on the scene of the politics of the time. And, you know, lots of special funny things, yeah. <laughs> good, bad, and indifferent, go on in Washington, D.C. And she went there for her meetings with the National League, and she met with all kinds of different people. And for her to come home with stories, uh, that's something I remember with, with pleasure. That was high-class gossip, I It was high-class <laughs> gossip, yeah. She was a classy lady, you would have to say that. I was very impressed with her as being president of the local league and, and her work nationally. Uh, I, I thought that was most unusual, and it was at that time. She was certainly a, a leader in the community as well as state and national. I would add one more thing at, at this little group of women uh, called Book Fellows. She darned socks while she was there, just like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and she knit during World War II. People yeah. knit things, you know, socks and scarves and things for the people in the service. She did all of that. I doubt that these children know, know what darning socks, socks is. Are. That's right. <laughs> Would you explain yeah. that? <laughs> well, you take a, a piece of, uh, of thread or yarn. Uh, it had several, it was like embroidery floss, and you'd uh, patch the holes in your socks. There was so. something we called a darning egg, and it was a piece of, of wood, smooth wood, that you'd slip inside the sock and it would hold the, usually, it, you know, you wear your socks out at the toe, usually. So you'd put that that firmly over the darning egg, and then you would sew up that hole. I still do it. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't throw things away. You, you, you repaired yeah. them. I mean, during the Depression, mm -hmm. uh, things were tough. And then during World War II, uh, there weren't lots of goods available in the yeah. civilian community, so you had to keep things going and not throw them away. Every pair. Okay. This podcast brought to you from La Crosse, Wisconsin by the Cooley Kids at Longfellow Middle School in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.